God, you are one with us in Jesus Christ, in Holy Spirit. We ask uh, that that Spirit be with us today as you open our minds to new prospects and possibilities so that we might see the inner linkages and meanings behind it all and behind all of that. You. We ask your blessing on our conversation. We ask your blessing on our planet as we are in desperate situations so often. Mm. We pray for your ordering spirit that we might all live in peace. We ask all of this through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, Ken. Amen. Good. So today, Tabe begins book one of a five-volume series that T.F. Torrance wrote, Christian Theology and Scientific Culture. The, the series was called Theology and Scientific Culture, so mm -hmm. the series took out that particular one. So there'll be four other books we'll do over the next month, which the one by Ian Paul on Einstein, Travis Devick will um, walk us through that session. That'll be in April that he'll do that. So anyway, just like the 12, we'll go through one book a month and hear uh, Torrance with other voices being brought in, but he, in both cases, began the series with the, the title book in a sense. So now the thing I'm doing that's a bit different with this, I'm, I'm bringing in another lens to engage this book. So I've been watching a series on um, BritBox called Silent Witness. Has anybody ever heard of that? Heard of BritBox. It's a great channel. Box. Silent Witness was 28 seasons of a woman who was is a forensic pathologist. So the nature of her work is to take dead people in dead situations and uh -huh. to figure out what happened, what was the cause of it. Um, and it generally, as in the case of much death, there's much mystery and often a lot of people who are hiding something. And so to say the nature of the inquiry requires getting around a lot of defenses, sometimes by criminals, sometimes by other medical professionals, sometimes by the police themselves. And so to say that there are many things that keep from getting at the truth of what it is that's going on. So to say the nature of the book that we're looking at today, if we look at what it is that T.F. Torrance is doing as a work of forensic theology, that he's he is entering into a discussion that's recognizing that something happened and there's been an attempt, and I'm going to use the word manslaughter, which means you didn't intend to kill this person. Nevertheless, they died. There was, there was either some sense of neglect or you were distracted elsewhere or something. So I'll be uh, using the terms God slaughter, which is to potentially unintentionally to not be getting rid of God, but that the nature of the form of science that developed, Torrance is identifying as an act of God slaughter. The nature of what happens quite often then is that we do get something that I will call manslaughter. It's an attempt by humans to promote humanity and to throw God out the window in the process. But in the end, humanity suffers because the conclusions become problematic. And then also something I will refer to as science slaughter, which is to divide and destroy the very nature of what science is to be in such a way that it makes it dead in a way that it need not be. So the word slaughter says, yes, something is dying. And the nature of, of the origin of the word slaughter, there's something that is struck at, is split. In the end, there is a killing that is a result of it. Um, an, an accompanying word to slay means to put an end to something or to gain by conquest. And so to say the history of science as conceived in this volume, Torrance is uncovering that there has been a kind of a conquest that has been a death of theological thinking because of a conquest by a particular form of science that is giving given something to humanity, but it's lost an appropriate understanding of God. God is not in fact killed, but as with the word manslaughter, um, it may be, and I, I'm using the word attempted God slaughter because you can't slaughter God, 
but you can bring in a slaughtering of humanity and a slaughtering of, of science with the God part. I think that there has been an intentionality to get rid of God, to slaughter God, but it's only an attempt because of the nature of who God is. One has a hard time actually slaughtering God. So I'm using these terms to, um, to unpack the chapters of this book and the flow of logic and to say, Corinth isn't just trying to engage Christian theology and scientific culture to have us just kind of have terms and definitions. He's motivated to recognize we lost something somewhere. We need to regain something, but we won't be able to do it until we do the forensic work of entering in and seeing where the choices were made that put us in directions that lost something and what we gained wasn't worth it because it actually killed the very discipline that we wanted to have come into play. So the other piece in that is in the end, Torrance is wanting to seek, um, in terms of the series Silent Witness, he's wanting to bring articulate witness he wants the nature of what it is the, the church does is to be an articulate witness. He's seeking a restorative kind of justice, that there would be a hearing of the nature of who God is in the person of Jesus. And that the very nature of the coming together of an appropriate theology and science would be a restorative kind of thing, which the term restorative justice would be the end of what people would get from the series that he's bringing about here, that the restoring of theology and science to their proper form will bring a kind of justice to humanity that will be restorative for humanity, firstly with God, then with one another, and the place of the person within it. So anyway, any questions just about the, the kind of the approach that I'm taking there? Or comments? What are the, we wish you are well. The... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the other four books you've you've signaled one by Ian Ian Paul. We have yeah, Hogsden, our nuclear future. Carnes, Axiomatics and Dogmatics. Science, Theology, and Einstein. That's the one that yeah. Travis will walk us through. And then this one, the, I don't have the desk cover for this one. Science, si Theology and Science and Mutual Modification by yeah, Nesselbeck. Whoa. whoa, whoa. So those are the other four texts that we'll look at over the course of the coming months, one, one a month. How 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 wide a circulation did the other four get? <laughs> so you're asking a good question to which I don't have an answer yet. Um, mm. one of one of the things that will be coming up, I've been granted a fellowship. Dear Dr. Folsom, congratulations. The Mellon W. A Andrew W. Mellon Travel Fellowship Committee has considered your application for research grants, and we are pleased to inform you have been awarded a grant for your project, P.F. Torrance, Theology and Science of the Frontiers of Knowledge and Science of the Personal. Um, and so I'll be at the University of Oklahoma in uh, July, working with Carrie and answering questions on the 12, and I'll also be looking at these five. And some of the questions I'll be asking are, what was the influence? What was the reception? of these texts so you did, you did cite a bibliographical tool uh earlier that it said this book gets quoted in the in the these following articles uh it, it, what is that tool again and uh is it generally available online or is that a subscription um i'm trying to think of what what you're referring to if i can get that that i'll be able to where did, what did i say uh, we were talking about the. Uh, I, I was asking, is is the uh, is Tom's first book quoted often enough to oh. to justify our spending time with it? And you said, oh yes, yes. it had more than a hundred and some mm -hmm. citations. Right. Uh, it was be so, it, it is out there, and I remember yeah. going through the Princeton Library and somebody saying, "There's where you find that stuff," uh, but I don't have access Good. to the Princeton Library anymore. 
Yeah. Yes. So this is an, an easy tool to find. You just go to Google Scholar. Ah. And in Google Scholar, you go and it comes up with this book. And at the bottom of the little entry, it says cited by. Mm -hmm. And you click on that and it comes up with a list of 165 citations where this book has been referred to. Whoa. Yes. Whoa. <laughs> uh, to, to be just a tiny bit skeptical, is it how do they know that? I mean, <laughs> the books didn't jump up and say, count me, count me. Somebody. Uh, artificial, it, it, intelligence, artificial intelligence, man. Me. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Cited means that it's either in a footnote or in the bibliography at the end. Yeah. I believe. But, so, yeah. Uh, Google, from all the stuff they have scanned, they know what what uh, prior to, uh, I think they have a copyright limit. They can't go come all the way up to the present and then scan those. But everything they scan, they can then digitize and digitize. They yeah. artificial intelligence can read it. So they can, yeah. starting at a certain date, they can go backwards and say, at that uh, from this time back, it was yep. quoted. But I don't know if yep. they can. Again, the whole document's not there, just the, the text from which it's cited and sometimes mm -hmm. there may be a small quote, yeah. but they you don't get access to all of the literature. So I think as a bibliographic tool, I believe they have you know quite an extensive. I also am not connected to a library now, so I don't have no. access to all the research tools that I that I have had. There was an old paper tool called Religion One. It was the religious index, a uh, big fat. That's thing. all. That's and all integrated into the current Atla online series. So, I mean, there there are tools that incorporate Religion Index 1 and Religion Index 2 now into them. Okay. And again, I need for some school to say, oh, Marty Folsom, you are such a helpful person to the theological community. We want you to, you know, be part of this and just mention that we give you access and um, and then I could, could do some of that further research. When okay. I am at the University of Oklahoma, I will have access to those research tools. That's the mm -hmm. advantage of being there and getting connected Whoa. with Carrie in that process. Mm -hmm. So that's a gift. Well done, Marty. So anyway, yeah. we'll keep we'll keep marching forward into all of those discovery things. So yeah. um just a little introduction. This book lays a foundation for scientific theological thinking that will be expanded in the other four books of the Theology and Scientific Culture series. He doesn't talk about theologic culture, it's scientific culture. And so mm -hmm. to just note the nature of the word culture as applied to science creating a culture, much of the forensic work that we'll be doing today in here is to ask about the nature of, you know, what is it that shapes a culture that then becomes a competitive culture, and he's going to be particularly seeing it as competitive against theological culture, an unnecessary competition. And in the end, his work is going to say that the nature of doing science and theology properly is that they are a benefit for all of human culture because it is informed by God. God is the one who is the very source and sustainer of human life and hence the possibility of human culture to flourish within what God has done. So again, the word culture has within it the word cult, which is the practices of a people. It's not merely a cult as in a bunch of weird people who do strange things. Mm -hmm. The nature of cultivate is going to be where the history that Horace is going to unpack in here is how it came to be cultivated that science became um, a God-slaughtering endeavor that humanity was attempting to relieve itself of what it saw as the oppression of theology and to have a kind of what they thought of as emancipation. And so the culture that science came to support largely became, as Torrance is unpacking it, something that not intentionally, but by consequence, something that was relieving itself of the presence of God, that it might be limitless in its own power in perceiving how control and the development of its own culture uh, comes into being. So there are just, there are words like that that make it, um, they're worth paying attention to. In some ways, this book echoes many other books. This is, this mm -hmm. is not a book that's totally mm -hmm. new 
but the nature of the dialogue that is here, it's relatively short. It is um, relatively concise in its in its history, and I think in its agenda, as we listen to in this way we're looking at it today, um, it'll provide a unique insight for what it is that Torres is doing and what, what we might hope to get out of it. So the nutshell, there are four chapters in this book, and those are outlined below. Torrance reviews the history of scientific thinking. He deals with the introduction of dualisms that divide and corrupt human thinking for theology and natural science. So the words divide and corrupt. This week, I had a moment where I woke in the night. My arm was under my wife, and the hand was starting to fall asleep. And so I just said, okay, spirit, you know, what do you have to teach me about this? There must be something that's there. And so the spirit said, the nature of blessing is that there is a proper flow of the things that are meant to flow. And when those <laughs> things get cut off, that is the word for cursing. If we can learn to read the very nature of scripture, the blessings and the curses, when there is a sense that God's purposes are being done, there is blessing. And when things are cut off that not ought to be cut off, then something of the curse comes into play. And so to say the nature of that set into the dialogue of science and theology is to say theology properly done allows for the flow of God to humanity and the flourishing of humanity within that. When cut off, when God is cut off, humanity is left um, in a gangrene state, so to speak. What seems like individualism is a good idea leads to death and destruction and a few other things like that. And so again, that's gonna be part of the framework within which we look. Brian, you had a question there. Well, I had an observation. Uh, you, you skimmed over it very quickly that there are allusions to lots of other Terentian works. Yes. And, 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 I've, and in that first handout you sent a while back, a few days back, I've read it and I've gone, hang on, he talks about that there. He talks about that there. He talks about that there. And I think it would be very helpful for those of us who don't have this compendium of a Torrance library in their heads uh, to kind of go, that's a reference to, that's a reference to, that's a reference to. And, and, and if you dare to do that with your second handout, which is the whole book, um, yes. I, it, I, I didn't work out what the two were doing. Um, I thought to myself, that could be very helpful for anybody who has a middle knowledge of of of, of Torrance and coming yes. to these dialogues, because there's this group in Melbourne called ISCATS, and it's a it's a very horrible acronym, but it's trying to integrate theology and science. Mm. And frankly, they have a very wonky notion of science and an even, and an even wonkier notion of theology. And it, it's kind of frustrating me like Bilio. I'll try and get their full-time or, well, paid part-time secretary onto this group. Yes. Because I think he needs this group. Hmm. Because... Well, that would be particularly good for theological science. Going through theological science would be a great place for a conversation to get Torrance's orientation as to what theological science means. The word integration is always problematic. Because integration kind of gives authority to two different systems and then simply chooses things that seem to fit together and doesn't pay as much attention to the problematic pieces that are often left hanging on there, which I always use the problematic nature of theology and um, psychology. Psychology assumes the individual. It is foundational, the individual and the problems of the individual in thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And so the primary schools of thoughts, theology done properly with the Terencian way, you can't begin with the individual. The individual is a mythology. And so everything you do after that starting point, yeah. whatever integration you're doing um, is problematic. If we begin with theology and the nature of persons in relationship as the being of God, Analogia relationis is the nature of the human relationship. Then we can say that psychology may give insights in terms of some of the breakdowns in relationality in our thoughts and feelings and behaviors, but they've been contextualized within a proper starting point. 
So I do I do think that there can be a contextualization, and I think that Torrance wants to do that, that theology provides a context for our proper scientific thinking. And in the work that we looked at um, with the grounded grammar of theology, in the end, there is a sense in which science and what it means for scientists to be priests of creation means that they are articulating scientific discovery in the context of God's created works. And so that's contextual, I think, rather than integration. Oh, the tendency is... Uh... We tend to colonize other things rather than genuinely get to know them and, and uh, learn from them. And it, there's no re reciprocity in the end. It's I, I'm only going to take the parts I want because yes. they're they're useful to me. And, yes. and they're not that I have anything that's useful to you. Probably not. Uh, but I'll yeah. at least I'll run your railroads on time. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think oh. that the nature of to gain by conquest was one of the terms that I threw out there for slay or to slaughter. Mm -hmm. And you use the word colonize. Colonization Colonize. tends to um, gain by conquest. And so there is there is a still present reflection of the original people, but it is a, a conquest that is not, it's a hegemony in a sense, as you say. It, it dominates um, uh, and eventually it excludes uh, and, and all that's left of the uh, uh, what we would call aboriginal are are the little bits and pieces that uh, we we couldn't figure out how to sell. Yeah, and the nature. I heard a Native American once say, you know, we don't believe in a a white god who came across in the Mayflower and wanted to set up, you know, the white values right. in this place. We do believe in Jesus that he did come from God. Yeah. But not that form of Christianity that is merely a garbed, um, a white garbed form of Western traditions that aren't really true to the nature even of who Jesus is. So yeah. another yeah. another definition of his sleigh was to to strike and in the process of setting up a tent, putting your pegs in the ground. Mm. And so that's very true, I think, to the nature of this work, that Torrance is identifying the pegs that have been put into the ground, that it just looked like a tent in the first place, but it ended up to be an institution, and one that, in a sense, overran hegemonically, as you're saying, Ken, the very nature of what theological work might look like. The, to Bryden's concern, uh, uh, Bryden, do you actually have a copy of the book? No, I do not. No, no, no. There's a... Uh... Each chapter at the end of the chapter. Uh, let's see if I get that near the camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah. There's a there's a biblia uh, uh, Tom's own suggestion of books yes. that would be relevant. In yeah, the, I saw that. Yeah, I, I saw that own. of the okay. of the first. Thank you. Every chapter yeah. has that. So yeah, and what I did the first handout. The first handout yeah. was just the preface and the first chapter, and the second one, as you said, was the outline of the book. Perhaps, Bryden, you could come across my copy I bought in 2015. I can't find it. Oh, 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 brother. Who did you yeah. lend it to? I bought it for $15. It sells for $30 now on Amazon. <laughs> so if I if I find two copies, I better post you one. <laughs> what? Say again? If sure. I find two copies, I better oh. post you one. Oh. How nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I'll yeah, do Bryden, that. Bryden has put into the uh, into the notes there the uh, ICAST. That's the Australian group you're talking about. And um, so they are ones who are doing poorly the nature of what it is that we are trying to do in a better kind of way. So, and then you also... Oh. Let's see here. You also say Colonialism and Mission by Stephen Neal. So that's a book. Um, it, it may only be encapsulated in any given culture, right? Is that the name of a book then? Call it Colonialism. No, it, 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 it comes in four or five different books. He, okay. he was, a, he was a, a bishop of the Church of South India. He then uh, was involved in East Africa. He was involved in South Africa. I mean, he was a single man. Um, and the interesting thing is, he finished up at Wycliffe Hall um, in Oxford, where he retired and, in fact, died from. And I think we need to be very careful 
and I've wrestled with this with a number of dear, dear brothers and sisters. Colonialism brought the gospel in many ways. Yeah. And for better or for worse. And how you sift the better and for, for worse is a really difficult, tricky business. Yeah. Because if the Native Americans from North America had brought the gospel to Europe, it would have been caught up in all their baggage. And I mean, you know, we all have baggage. Yeah. And I think we need to be very gentle, but also perspicacious and honest and humble. Because, I mean, you know, the famous book, Christianity Rediscovered and all that stuff, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of, yes, when the Maasai see it for themselves, in inverted commas, it becomes different. Yeah. But even in Western culture, when we see Jesus for himself in the 21st century, oh, it's an alleluia moment because our Western culture has domesticated and inoculated us. Mm. Uh, it's a it, it's a never ending thing. So this series you're now promoting could be really, really helpful in peeling back these things because, yeah. I mean, when people pull down Cecil John Rhodes' statue from Oriel College, Oxford, I have to quietly say, and how many of you are Rhodes scholars? I mm. mean, you know, <laughs> you know? I mean yes, yes it's, it's real. It's real. It's just ridiculous. Yes. Anyway, enough, enough. Yeah. Well, I think to say that the nature of Torrance's work is always corrective and also yes. visionary. So there are things in the past that may need to be corrected, and there's a sense of colonialism, as you're pointing <laughs> out, that is problematic. Mm -hmm. There are also things that can be learned from the culture that one engages. And so that's also a value is, you know, what are the things, what is their history, what is the wisdom? When yeah. people ask me the question, you know, I talk about just the, the Greco-Roman traditions and how it has swept the world as some form of control or living in the world of philosophies, you know, basically is everywhere, and that the nature of the original form of Hebrew apperceptions is a people uh, who know who they are as a people, as a people of God, not based on the land or even specifically history of their own conquest and development of a culture, i.e. Rome or Greece. Um, they say, is there anywhere in the world that you've seen this? And I said, well, the closest I've seen it is in the islands of the South Pacific, where the Cook Islanders, the Samoans, they have a sense that they're not really competing that much with anybody. They have family, they have wonderful feasts. Um, the nature of relationship is at the fore. And when I was in New Zealand, the nature of the priority of family over business even meant that businesses would take turns, one, staying open at night for people to get groceries, but they would switch around. They worked together to make sure people had time with their families, a month, I think, for vacation. And it was all based on the value of relationships and families. So I said, that's the only place in the world I've seen it. I haven't been everywhere, so I don't know. But I do know that it can exist in some form. And so to say the culture that Torrance is promoting when he talks about um, Christian culture at some level, it's easy for Greco-Roman forms of Christianity to dominate. But the possibility of something that is truly humble and serving, which Jesus came as a colonizer in a sense, but humble and meek and building with the marginalized and the poor and the outcast. And so I think all of those things are important to recognize the way Jesus came as the one who's colonizing, empowered and enriched the life of everyone wherever he went. Broke down walls, built communities. But that's a, a more proper form, maybe. And the word mission with colonialism there might look something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Mm -hmm. So the nature then, he outlines a path forward in scientific methodology, engaging the nature of reality with light as a prime focus. So the four chapters... We will look briefly at the preface, but Christianity in scientific change is a history of the process of God slaughter. That is science attempting to get rid of God, intentionally or unintentionally. It's the promotion of humanity over against God that causes what I'm calling God slaughter. The second chapter on the priority of belief, whose belief matters and that the nature of God is the one who informs belief versus the human taking over the role of a believer with what is believable to me 
is a move even in the systems of belief that loses something. And then there are people who come along, notably Maxwell and Einstein and Polanyi, who reestablish the nature of belief in a way that is the restorative justice, the restorative sense of what is reality and how do we live in the light of that. The theology of light in chapter three is going to be a survey of the deepest sense of reality is the ordering of the universe of which light is the constant within it all. So Torrance is going to build an argument on the nature of science proper that created light is that which we see in the universe. Uncreated light, God himself, and the person of Jesus is the one who enables to see everything else. And so he's laying a foundation for the um, contextualization of our understanding of created light within the uncreated light of God who gives us the ability to see all that is. And then the last chapter on word and number as those who are building scientific cultures as Christians, we have to acknowledge, we observe, we reflect, we use numbers and we use words to be able to interpret the reality we engage. And we have to do those, but with humility and as a community open for correction and growing in the light of what is there. Um, so we have to understand that those that don't have authority by themselves, as often mathematics, physics, et cetera, establish their own kind of authority, but rather even they are servants within the process of coming to know what is known. So that's just a quick overview of the book and what he's doing there. So any questions or thoughts on that so far? Yes. Yes, just something um, simple. I notice you use different colors in your emphasis. Yep. Right? Any uh, oh. method to that? Well, Pardon. all of the yellows, the yellow was simply to, to outline the major structure of the book. So I did the yellow there, you can see with the outline and then throughout the yellow allows you to recognize where it is that you are within that structure. The the green tends to be things that I like. Green's my favorite color. Huh. So oh. major points, the, the blue, I didn't use as much. Um, they tend to be places where it's something that is being called into question. Okay, thank you. Um, I do a lot of green. Anyway, that it, it, they are not fixed interpretations. They are intended to be highlights to allow you to make sure that you're getting major things that need to be picked up as we go through the book. So the, as the word highlight does, it allows you in a sense an island what? hopping what? kind of thing. And Brighton turned color printing off. So everything is just black and white. I mean, <laughs> That makes you colorblind. That's okay. Well, as some of them, if you turn the color off, it's just dark and hard to read. Oh, well. So looking then briefly at the preface, there is a strong reciprocal relation dependencies between science and religion, according to Einstein. So Einstein is going to be foundational in the whole book. Einstein is one of the great discoverers, but even Einstein himself is going to make a fatal move that he doesn't quite kill God, but he kills the bridge Torrance would have liked Einstein to have made. He chooses Spinoza, in a sense, to define the nature of God. Spinoza's God is an impersonal God. If you get rid of the personal, you have done an act of manslaughter, an unintentional removal of the nature of the living God revealed in the person of Jesus. So he wants to both hold Einstein up, but also to recognize there's something amiss that is there. So he goes on and talk about in the next little quote there, which again, in the in, in the preface, much of what I did, I just uh, summarized all of the all of the uh, footnotes in the rest of the book. I literally copied and pasted, so you have the exact places where I got those quotes uh, throughout the book. If you want to further explore Good. the broader context of the systems where they come, so the aim of natural science is limited to determine how facts are related to and conditioned by each other. And in that way, to attempt what he called the posterior reconstruction of existence by the process of conceptualization. So this is Einstein again. And so to say there is a necessary, and again, using the words blessing and curses, 
Einstein wants to bless humanity by recognizing how things relate to one another and that there's a conditioning that happens and we understand those things. We can look back and put together an understanding what's going on, what he calls a process of conceptualization. So mm -hmm. in John McMurray's articulation of this, we act in the world. Once you have acted in the world, you can think about it or reflect on it. And then you have an idea and you can build on those reflections and think about the nature of reality and then choose to act again within the world, now having the insight gained from that first action. So I do think that uh, there's a sense in which P.F. Torrance really builds on McMurray's concept of that. Um, even if you think about the day of Pentecost, everyone heard in their own language, the mighty acts of God, that there is something about the action of God, that God's being is in God's act. And so in having access to God's act is to understand a world which, within which science can then begin to interpret the nature of the activity of God as God has created it. So that's a framework for all of the work in this book. So the incarnation of the word and the communion of the Holy Spirit teach us what we may and may not read back into God. And so I wrote next to that, read back into God. For Torrance, that's always an act of God slaughter. When you read human things back into God, you are killing the presence of God and replacing it with a human idea that kills the presence of God and dominates with the nature of the human. So some of what I'll be doing then is just to help um, articulate what our words we read all the time of Torrance is to get more of the weightiness of what it is that's there in Torrance's work. So Brighton says, McMurray's order, C2 Bernard Lonergan's method and theology and insight. So I haven't read much of Lonergan. I know that he's one of the philosophers of consciousness that's put alongside Polanyi in some texts, but I don't know enough to really be able to unpack much of what, of what he's saying there. Do you want to make a comment on that? Um he he produced what he wanted to call a general empirical method. He was an economist. He was a mathematician. He was a polymath. He died in 1984. And certainly the idea of experience and understanding and evaluation and judgment and action, they are they, they, they are a, a, a spiral of of hermeneutical awareness. Mm -hmm. And and yes, he's he is a philosopher of consciousness, but he then goes on finally to reach because it's a stratified thing for him yeah. it finally reaches love uh, uh, so it's 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 a it, it's actually a very beautiful awareness of what the world is and mm -hmm. and and i mean he is now being i think explored in the secondary and even tertiary literature right. there you go that's all good thank you thank you good so point f <laughs> this book aims to create a dialogue. <clears throat> so this is the sense of flow and blessing, right? There's a missing flow between science and theology that he th needs to be there. And so in this book, he wants to, to reopen this dialogue between theological and natural science that might, um, that might play a very important and helpful role in human reasoning. <laughs> and again, the nature of reasoning um, is that it isn't something that science owns reasoning or separately Theology has a reasoning that isn't working together. So um, if we don't have that dialogue, I would say at some level, this leads to manslaughter. It's an intentional strangulation of humanity because it's lost the ability to understand its meaning, its purpose, its appropriate connections with God as well as the natural world. So sometimes it looks like we're talking about God, but the what's getting killed is us. Hmm. So what is envisioned here is an exercise in conjoined thinking where theological science and natural science have common ground with the rationalities and objectivities of the created order, but where each pursue a different objective. So if one part of your body goes in one direction and the other part goes another direction, you get a splitting headache. And so to say at some level, the nature of for Torrance, the nature of what has happened between theology and science is it's left humanity with a splitting headache because our science has um, moved away from what it is that would be a healing head, um, a head healing, not head hunters here. So at the top of page two, then 
the green part. It is through deep going dialogue with science and submission of our own theological conceptions to the critical questions it addresses to us that we are helped to purge our minds of pseudo theological and the pseudo theological that's all you know god killing god god slaughtering as well as pseudo scientific so that's science slaughtering so he's saying the very nature of what science is has been slaughtered it's been colonized has been taken over by things that really kill what science should be. And so are enabled to build up theological knowledge in a positive way on its own proper ground. And so the nature of science then is the healing process of aligning with the God who created the proper flow between God and humanity in that order, and then humanity and God in that order. And that his work in this book is to rebuild the foundations where that could could be at work. So that's the preface. Any thoughts on the preface? Any responses so far as to what his agenda is or where I'm attempting to build with it? You're good? Good? Okay, so chapter one, Christianity in Scientific Change. So he notes in points A and B, these the death of Maxwell, the birth of Einstein, the death of Galileo, and the birth of Newton, that these are, in a sense, they are transitions in the history of scientific culture and that there is something about <clears throat> what it is that Maxwell brought in that Einstein built on. What Galileo did, Newton, in a sense, took classical mechanics in a not good direction, I think is what he would say. So point C, the deep change from mechanical to relational thinking. Um, and that's particularly I, that Maxwell initiated reach its culmination in Einstein's work and really Polanyi beyond that, he's going to say. Point D then, what I propose to do is to offer some kind of an answer to the question, how are we from within the Christian faith to regard these changes that have been taking place and what is their significance for Christianity today? So again, the nature of dualism is going to be the major problem in all of it and the nature of a proper aligning between theology and science is going to be the restoration, giving back theology and the God who created the world a proper place in our thinking. So point F, cultural assumptions, after all, are most dangerous when we're unaware of them. And so this is, I'm going to call this culture slaughtering. So those people who introduce into cultures things that drain it, that starve it of its understanding of an appropriate understanding of God, of those things that Christianity would bring. They starve culture of what would be life for it, and they become dangerous because we can't even see them. And all we have to do is to say all of those assumptions that we end up with in our presuppositions or prejudgments as to what is right and that the human is right and God's no longer necessary and the word prejudgment very quickly collapses into prejudice. And so every prejudgment on the value of one race over another, of one gender over another, of one age of a person over another, of every education of a person over another, every one of them becomes something that becomes problematic and a power struggle. So Torrance, as I think, is really entering into what his brother James really picked up on that is just the if you have a bad theology, you're going to end up with social and cultural breakdowns everywhere. And you have to address them at the theological level because that's really where the problem began. That's where the culture slaughtering began in losing its concept of God. So point G, scientific culture must surely be recognized as having the most powerful and widespread impact in modern times. And so a translation that might be to say, Science has weaponized science to get rid of God so that the modern mind might go on doing what it wants. So it's a particular use of science that has been to disempower the church and to empower a kind of thinking that particularly aims for the individual, the ab ability of nations to arm themselves against other nations and so forth like that. We can go on to all of the inclinations of an individualized, atomized form of thinking that we find out is represented in point H with Galileo and Newton, who end up with closed mechanical systems. The world is mechanical, nations are mechanical, 
even governments themselves and the role, excuse me, the role of those who run them end up being all mechanized systems. So that ends up being another act of God slaughtering. My throat is God slaughtering me. <laughs> okay. So the word that's critical here is impersonal. Right? Once you get a kind of science that is impersonal, Personal. Okay. Oh, Evil brother, you have God. sympathy. I've been coughing for four days. <laughs> so the nature of of what impersonal looks like takes on a variety of different manifestations, and the nature of of what is made mechanical. Mechanical is something that humans can control the concept of what it is that's going on, right? Cause and effect, all these things are reduced to the act without any question of the intention or the meaning or the purpose. All, all of that gets lost. And so a, me a mechanistic conception of the universe um, is profoundly problematic because it is it is void of God. And the human is left to explain it for their own terms, in a sense. Budgetary leverage to delineate policy, says Bryden. Yes. <laughs> I mean, every politician, every economist, it just goes, it trips off their tongues as if they can solve the problem by throwing money in this way. Yeah. So again, the, the word... Levers, the word control is another word for that. So to yep. say the nature yep. of the world that Torrance is concerned about is where we've reduced everything to the ability for humans to control it all, right? In a mechanistic world, you can do that. <laughs> a world where you are servants of a living God and therefore leaders are um, given a call by God to serve the people. That's another another mode of leadership that gets lost in the kind of world where everything is contained and you have abstract and artificial characters of the world and government and everything. And he he blames that at some level on Galileo and Newton, their, their thoughts of causality and mechanic, mechanical notions, um, all of those become problematic for him. Uh, uh, Mrs. Newton and Mrs. Galileo would like to jump in here and say he was really a lovely person. He really was. Uh, it, it's a very violent metaphor to describe everything as slaughter, 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 slaughter. Yes. Uh, well, Isaac, was, Isaac was down in his basement trying to figure out the, the value of K. So he knew what the gravitational contact would be. Yes. Uh, and now he has a wonderful memorial at, at Westminster Abbey. Everybody yes. loves Isaac, but science itself was damaged by certain presuppositions yep. that got built into science on his reputation. Yes. Maybe he, if you had challenged him on it, he might have said, you know, I, I'm not so sure about that, but everybody yep. were running along behind saying, uh, hallelujah. Yeah, well, that, that Isaac Newton, uh, was it uh, Volt? No, it was uh, I, uh, Alexander Pope that said yeah. everywhere was darkness and then God said, let Newton be. Let be. Yes. Which yeah. divinized Newton. Uh, yes. Newton, meantime, is still down in his basement trying to figure out how gravity works. Uh, yes. I've just sort of demilitarize the metaphor for a yes. moment. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. There was actually a note that I forgot to say, which you've just highlighted that I need to make sure that it's said. Mm. So thank you for saying that. In the in the use of the word manslaughter in the court, that is something where there's a death without malice, without intention, and yeah, not and premeditated. Right. Which uh, much of the damage that that, that Tom is is describing uh, is the collateral damage. On, in the pursuit of something else. Yeah, uh, good. And, yeah. and the, 
And so one of the peacemaking functions that both sincere scientists and sincere theologians can be yep. doing in yep. is working out the basis of the reconciliation of science and religion is to find all of the phony science in science and purge yep. it. And all the yep. phony, the mythology and, and ideal, uh, idolatry in our religion and purge it, uh, which yep. we say we, we cannot do, but Jesus can. Uh, that's yep. uh, But the poor little uh, Albert Einstein, uh, he, he was just, he has a, had a lovely little house in Princeton. Everybody loved him. Yep. Uh, really no, quite yeah. sweetie. Yeah. We, did, we probably need to say it a few times as we go through that my use of the word slaughter is not like going out and slaughtering a cow. Mm. It is merely the unintentional, um, not premeditated collateral damage is, is a word that is there that came from when you choose this, you lose that. And I'm using the word slaughter there. Just I am attempting to emphasize the force with which these decisions were made ends up being something like manslaughter, you still got somebody that's dead there. Mm. And to say that culture has become secularized is, is to say the God is dead movement. There are there are many people even who go to church who they are practical atheists. They live yeah. for the most part as though God does not exist. And so that is that is the sense that I think that Corinth is working on I'm raising the visibility with the word slaughter in the hmm. sense of manslaughter, God slaughter, culture slaughter to say it was not the intention of these people. Many of them were Christians who were trying to understand the world. But if we don't go back and do our forensic work, how did this happen? How did we get here? Hmm. Then we will not recognize all that Torrance is wanting us to see and to say that by using the word slaughter, there's going to come a point here where I'll say, what's the opposite hmm. of slaughter? So you go up and look for opposites, and it it is liberating or setting free or bringing life where there was death, right? And so that's why Tor Torrance is the he resurrection is the best image that's there. He wants to resurrect science. He wants to resurrect culture, but we have to understand that there's been a slaughter in the in the limited use of the way I'm using the word to then recognize the possibility that Torrance sees that resurrection is still possible. You good with that, Ken? Yeah. Uh, just, in this very highly limited context, I'm good with that. I just uh, okay, good. But I mean, we yeah, we need that sharpening. Pathologists you know, finding dead people and going, what killed them? Discover that they were applying lead on their skins so their skins would be white. Yes. Uh, poisoned themselves. Now, that's not manslaughter. That's that's form of suicide maybe but it's, it's not a form of suicide yeah and i mean and it's we, an could potentially, no we could potentially learn from that metaphor too i think all these metaphors allow us to see things that could remain hidden yeah and yeah. so that's and really the purpose of, of what i'm yeah, trying to do so we all are using the metaphor culture war mm -hmm. uh, using the metaphor of warfare to describe yeah. differences of opinion because it matters uh, and that one, as you are saying, uh, w through all these graphic depictions, uh, Tom is saying is is that uh, yes, we are in the middle of culture wars, not one one culture against another, but multiple cultures all fighting, competing for the 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 the, the whole ball of wax, yeah. uh, not making space for anybody else. And in the meantime, misunderstanding gets compounded on misunderstanding. And in the middle of all that, Oppenheimer's pushing the big red button. Uh, it is yeah. very, very dangerous. Yep. But yeah. it, behold, I send you as 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 sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. Yeah. And I, and I think Torrance wants to be all that in the process. I do mm. think that raise, raising the limit, and I, I, Dwayne, I see your unintended consequences. I think that's exactly right. If somebody can, they read that and they pass by and it doesn't have the emotional impact of saying God slaughter. Yeah. But the, the, the first right. tendency if somebody were to read this would be to ban all of Newton's books. Because if, if he's a murderer, ban his books. 
Right. You can't do that in science. You just but we can't do, do yeah, that. It's, we need to understand that the insights that Torrance brings is the unintended consequences of what he did and that they killed God in most of Western culture. So, I mean, that's mm. when somebody is charged with manslaughter, you don't take away the seriousness of the death. You still, you still mourn for that death and all that. And you don't, you don't look at the person the same way because you recognize it was an accident. It wasn't an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. And yet there is a responsibility that is held as well. You yeah. were responsible to be paying attention. And so that that may be something that Torrance does want to bring in. Brighton, I see that hand. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to emphasize Ken's spousal metaphor. Mm. If you ask Karl Marx what Jenny was up to, he wouldn't have had a clue. And, and I mean, you know, Jenny for me tells me what Karl Marx really is about. Huh. I mean, poor Jenny and the kids and, and, the kids. and the farming out of the kids. And I mean, you know, if you want to understand Marxism and its consequences, have a look at Jenny and the kids. Huh. That's enough. Thank no, you, Ken. That's a subject for another another conversation, I think. But Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. <laughs> Okay, so just mo moving through again, um, point B, with the so-called Copernican revolution of Immanuel Kant's conception of absolute time and space transferred from the mind of God to the mind of man. So I want to suggest, using my narrow sense of it, that is God slaughter. You've just made God un unnecessary, removed from the equation of what scientific work does, and so it's an un unintended action trying to give power to the human that that leaves God aside, and Kant is going to be a major person who is going to be looked at with within that. Uh, point B: We cannot th know things as they are in themselves or in their internal relations, but only in terms of the orderly patterns we impose upon them. So again, just to hear within my narrow def definition of God slaughter, when our conceptions get imposed upon God, we've we've asked God to please remove Himself from our universe. And we're going to take over. So that is the problematic of Kant's thinking, which uh, volume one, chapter one of John McMurray's The Self as Agent is basically a critique of Kant on that point. So he goes on, discusses Kant. We're not going to look in, in every point, but point um, F. So far as Jesus Christ is concerned, it means that all knowledge of Jesus Christ in himself must be ruled out of account is mere pretense, for all that may be known of him derives from his appearances to his contemporaries, or rather from what they made of his appearances for themselves. So that, again, I would suggest within my narrow definition of God's slaughter, that, that was an act of God's slaughter. You've just split him off, made him unnecessary. Point C with Maxwell, He's going to move from this mechanical way of thinking and move to a dynamic and relational way of thinking, which, again, within my terms, blessing and cursing. He is calling for the blessing of the nature of reality as created, that God creates a dynamic and relational world. He particularly looks at, at it in fields of thought, and that opens up the flow of the understanding of things that might be there that Einstein will later build on. Um, in point three on page six then the dualism between theoretical and empirical aspects of reality this is the splitting headache of western science right that either reality is either in ideas the mind or it's empirical in the material world and what we can observe of the material world and in either case to leave out the other part is an act of of god slaughtering because either you Say it's all theory and God's a theory and God is out there. D is basically God is out there somewhere, but he doesn't really interface with the material world. So God has been slaughtered from being in the world or God has become imminent in the world. And there's there's no God out there. God is the world. And you have some form of pantheism or maybe pantheism, <laughs> something that collapses God into the world. And particularly my thoughts in my heads about the world um, might be something as part of that collapse as well. But once you divide you conquer. And God, the God who is the God um, who oversees all of our thinking and the being of the world, that God has been split in half and doesn't reside in one part of it. 
And it's as damaging of seeing either Jesus is all God, but not human or all human, but not God. You have the same impact. And therefore the nature of Jesus as true God is crucified in that act. And so dualism within Torrance's thought is always dealing with that. Whenever you do have dualism, you are cutting God in half in a sense in the person of Jesus, because all of your conclusions will flow from that. So the nature of dualism, he goes on and talks, and you can see I've got a number of points there. Um, in point E, or excuse me, D, Einstein called for an indissoluble integration of geometry and experience at all levels of scientific investigation and the the theoretical formulation. That was an attempt that Torrance sees Einstein was attempting to do what uh, what Maxwell had done, and that is to reintegrate the nature of the unity of reality. So dualism versus unity, you'll hear Torrance talking about unity all the time. And you might say, well, you know, what's the big deal about unity? I mean, it does have many parts. Well, for Torrance, it's, you know, once you get, once you abandon the concept of the unity of all reality, you've abandoned the God who holds it all together, the God who um, is the context of understanding all of reality, everything falls apart for Torrance at that point. And in Torrance's letter of appreciation for McMurray, that was the first point he made as to what it is that McMurray had done that uh, made him a worthy person to be knighted, which he wasn't knighted, but a worthy person to be knighted. And that he was he was 50 years ahead of the rest of us is what Torrance says in that, in that paragraph. So again, there was a period of time here where people also like Polanyi were acknowledging the unity of all reality. And it is it is also, in terms of reality being included, it's also the nature of understanding that God has to be understood in all of reality too. So there's so much tied up with the word dualism and unity in those words about the nature of truly holding to something that is grounded in reality and not the selective role of humans to break it up so they can control it which is what always dualism is going to mean for Torrance. So going on to page seven then, in J, the damaging effect of this dualism is widely apparent today in two related ways. So in detaching Christ from God, so this is a breaking apart, the detachment of Jesus from oneness with God robs him of any central or ultimate place in the Christian faith. So that's an act of breaking God apart. I call that God slaughtering in my appropriately narrowed definition of it. <laughs> and secondly, in detaching Christianity from Christ. So if you detach Christianity from Christ, he's relegated to a only transient second order significance and the attachment of Christianity to the church regarded as an ecclesiastical institution competing with technological society. So theology at some level is slaughtered at this point. You've, you've cut off the head of theology and you're left with a body that's running around, but it's lost its head. And th there would be many examples of the church doing that, the headless church, that Jesus is still the head, but they don't know it. And so they operate with something split apart. So the church becomes regarded as an ecclesiastical institution competing with a technological society. So the church as institution mechanized at some level and technological society mechanized, they live in competition with one another, hence the battle of religion and science. So in point four of three, rapidly suffers the decomposing patterns of modern social existence and its fragmenting culture. And so this I'm calling culture slaughtering. Once you do this breaking apart, Jesus from God, the church from Jesus, all that, you end up with a culture that's abandoned to itself. It decomposes, fractures into individualism and power struggles between different parties, each vying for their own power. Uh, and it's all the fruit of going back to in the forensic work, having lost the nature of the God who created and oversees it all. So in K, there is this sense, since dualist modes of knowing and interrupting or interpreting reality have already been overcome through a rigorously scientific unitary understanding, this is the resurrection thinking for Torrance, right, of an orderly universe in which theological science as well as natural science must function, 
a very different outlook is promised. So again, the nature of if the opposite of slaughter is resurrection or setting free, Torrance says when theology and science work together, it is the setting free both of theology and science. It is the emancipation from the fears and bondage to me mechanistic ways of thinking that ultimately become damaging. So on page eight, then let me pinpoint several positive aspects in recent scientific change. So positive aspects is going to be a restoring outline. So he's going to go through a variety of different ways that are out to change the nature of how we think about what it is that science does. And in point four, the scientific principle holds that everything must be investigated and conceived, conceived strictly in ways appropriate to its nature in a process of, of dynamic interaction between the knower and the known. A different approach is taken in the interpretive bases of theology. So again, with a unitary world, now we have an interactive, dynamic encounter and being taught by reality what it is that would be there. So for Torrance, the resurrection piece that he sees is that there's this coming alive of science and coming along alive of theology as they're reintegrated and become something that allows the flow of who God is to again be heard, acknowledged, and lived in the light of. And science begins to study the, the world in a stewarding kind of way, a serving of God and humanity, so that all scientific investigation does what the best of medicine does, what the best of forest management does, the best of what caring for looks like. That is a reconstituted um, the vision which a forensic pathologist can't do. They can't bring people back to life. But Torrance sees the possibility of both science and theology coming back to life with his proposals um, that are, are being put out here. Jumping over to page nine and point M, there are two cognate aspects of the variety and unity of rational order, which have been a particular relevance for theology, not least in its dialogue with natural sciences. So we have, we have to develop different languages appropriate to the distinctive kinds of reality we encounter if we are to understand them adequately and coordinate them in our thought, which again, just the nature of the word person when used with God and persons in the church means one thing. And person, when you're, you're admitting somebody into the hospital, it may mean that the, that person with a the body there and we need to keep them alive because they're bleeding all over the floor. But you're, you're meaning it in these different contexts and you have to recognize that the language that you're using needs nuancing in each context to really get at what's going on. Yeah. And then once the language has been clarified, it needs to be kept clear by yes. full disciplined use by people that are informed about what they're doing. Otherwise, everything degenerates back to the Tower of Babel. Yep, uh, yep. And then yep. Perichoresis was the example we had in the last book, or the uh, two books back. The, the, the word is all over uh, popular theology these days, but not the way the the, the theologians who coined it meant. Yep. It, it, yep. It's vandalism. Yeah, and there was a post on, I think it was on the, it may have shown up in the TF Torrance website, I can't remember, it was in the BART one too, on the question of BART's use of persons and modes of being and Ooh. modalism and all that. Yeah. And so again, that, that term has to keep being characterize again in light of what Bart meant by it and what signs wise, you know, ways of being might mean God, God's one being and three ways of being and how we can understand that and to not merely um, think of person as three centers of consciousness, which I don't know many people that actually hold that. But anyway, it's a, it's a way mm -hmm. that one could possibly, and so we have to clarify, as you're saying, Ken, yeah. and make sure that we keep doing that. And Bart himself uses persons throughout the rest of the church dogmatics, but he's done the work of saying, I don't mean that, and I do mean this. And so we need we need to really keep that clarifying away. That is part of who we are as doctors of the church, is the oh. clarifying process. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so, the institutions that keep our language uh, perpetuate our ability to carry on our conversations include yeah. the church and our yeah. universities and our our, yeah. our Bible study groups, uh, all in all these places, we need to be responsible for the use of the language. 
Yeah. And if we're not careful, then somebody's going to write a book like The Shack and completely <laughs> misuse all classic Christian language in, in touting uh, I have no idea what the theology is supposed to be. But because no one can, uh, apparently, it can, uh, books can become bestsellers by, by just grabbing any theological term off the shelf and pushing it into the public uh, with, a, with, a, with a snazzy cover. I, right. uh, I think I know what he was doing, but we, we won't go into the chat conversation at this point. And okay. Um, just got people talking again is the thing. At the American Academy of Religion, somebody stood up and said, the one good thing I can say is you got people talking about the Trinity again. It's like, that's true. And we and we haven't been able to do that, <laughs> the Academy. So if, if for no other reason than that, there, there is some value there. All right. Well, you, uh, <laughs> You're not going to call him a god slaughterer at this point. Uh, um, not at this point. Okay. No, just ask. <laughs> but that's okay. And I understand there are multiple sides of that conversation. So the, the nature of point three there, I want to point out, we must understand the stratified structure of the universe and our knowledge of it. And I think at this point to say we can't be reductionists, right? Reductionism is another form of god slaughtering where you say, God is nothing but this. Our Christianity is nothing but this. Our Jesus is nothing but this. And so there, there is a richness that is required to have an appropriate um, maintaining the nature and character of God that Torrance is bringing with clarity here. And this is, Ken, to your point, this is the appropriate thing with the shack, is that it requires a follow-up that clarifies an appropriate understanding of God that may not have been intended in his writing of the book, but that does say we have the responsibility to keep going on and doing the clarifying work and to understand the stratified <laughs> structure of the universe and God is part of that of that responsibility of the church uh, in engaging that. So on page 10, then, the whole nature of uh, point, well, point one, scientific knowledge embodies layers of coherent comprehension which answer to and are affected by the coordinated layers of orderly re relations in reality itself. And so part of that, when you lose touch with reality and theories take over, which for Plato, reality was the world of ideas. And so the nature of what is real at some level was reduced to generalized concepts. And again, both Bart and Torrance are gonna resist generalities everywhere because generalities missed specifics and what is missed in the specifics is too much. So in, in counseling, when, when a husband or wife says, you know, any other woman in the world would love what I what I bring here. It's like, yeah, well, you haven't got any woman in the world. You've got this woman. And you need to learn to relate to her. That's what, that's what you need to do is the particular here. We don't need the generalized. And I don't know if your first comment is true or not. We're not going to worry about that because... The particular is important. And so I think Torrance is very concerned that our theology, if it's serious, scientific, theological, needs to recognize reality in forming our understanding and not our generalizations. And so the second point, characterized through what might be described as the principle of coherent integration from above, which I will describe as seeing everything in context, which again, my sense earlier is not, we don't need to do integration, we need to do con contextualization. So all of Bart's and Torrance's use of analogia fide, analogia relationis, they're all saying we have to let God be the context of our language and our scientific work in order to be authentic. And when you go in trying to begin with analogia entis, you're trying to integrate your thinking and your experience with God, and you're going to end up doing God slaughter. You're going to take over. Your thoughts will take over, and you'll miss God. And that will be too too problematic. So the nature of what it means then to go ahead. Oh, I thought somebody said something. Okay. The nature of what it means to work with um with the thinking that Torrance is putting out is that all well, doctors, she's not getting up. All policemen all, I gotta get all, all people here. easily can Howard, I think there. I'll be there. I'll get it. Where is it? It's not Howard, your your microphone's on there. Let's see. I have the button there. Okay, there we go. Okay. 
the power. nature, the power. nature, <laughs> I do, I have power, yes. Um, the nature of not living in coordination with one another, his, his point in point three of the coordination of science and theology means mm. that somebody is going to take over. And again, in this series, sometimes it's the doctors who want to conceal things for their interest. They did something and they don't want people to know. Or the police, they got a bad guy. And so they had to allow something to happen to another person so that they can maintain keeping the bad person in jail. And so whenever somebody chooses to separate out their agenda, read in, even if for good purposes, it is an act of no longer coordinating and their self-interest, even as for a good self-interest, you begin into a path of deception and breakdown of trust when people find out um, what has happened, which it's funny how often people get found out somewhere down the road that there was deception going on. And so for Torrance, all of these things, if we don't live with theology and science working together, the deception ultimately will have its way. People will find out or they'll live with the consequences of it and wish that somebody could have pointed out what was happening. So the last part, verse number six there, as far as theological science is concerned, the created universe must be regarded as having been given and sustained in its rational order, not insofar as it is open, open to upward toward God, the maker of all things visible and invisible. Um, so theological science has to be open to the created universe and not to get rid of God and try and explain it as though God was not present. So that's chapter one. That was the text that you I, get, I printed for you. All of that you've been able to read. So everything else after this, unless you have the book or had the book once, and Bill, it's caught, it's caught somewhere in the back of your head because you've lost your copy, but <laughs> there are copies of these available at a variety of places that use books. They're, they are out there. So And it is republished by Wiffenstock as well. It's available through Logos in digital form. Um, so there are a variety of ways that one can gain access to this. You know, I, I, uh, I received that copy from England, my first copy. It smells so badly of mildew that I, it, you've had it, you've experienced that. Yeah. I had to yeah. send it back. <laughs> I, I sent it back and got another one and then it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Yes. So. Well, it's, it may be the prodigal book. It may come home at some point here and, I probably left it in uh, one of the book boxes when we moved, and it's gone. Well, there are more oh, out there. We will oh. believe in the resurrection of that book in one form or another. Yeah. For you, so. well, actually, uh, so, I just wanted to comment. I think the yeah. best part of this book is the theology of light. That's why I, yeah. I got that, and you know, and, and to me, that that's what John McKenna was working on. He, yeah. you know, and and and, and him with Philopinus and this stuff like that because. One of the last things he did was he went to go see Tom before he died, but he, he went to go visit Serge Abbey over there at Oxford to talk about Philophanes, and he was working on some stuff. You know, I just, I wish he would have lived to finish what he was working on yeah. because, because. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to chapter three here. So we're not, we're not done yet. Oh, but oh, we're, so it's, okay, we're just, I'm just saying we've, we've finished the part that you had access to. I'm not done. We're going to go ahead and do chapters two, three, and four in a in a much more summarial kind of way, but we'll just recognize what's there, and we'll definitely try and get the high point of the nature of light within Torrance's vision of the resurrection of science. So in the priority of belief, again, he's going to go through the classics of, of Bacon, uh, Newton, the Kantian synthesis, um, and he's going to see in each of these just pro problematic moves that ultimately uh, mechanize, depersonalize, and give over to human control the nature of what belief looks like, that the human comes to dominate, God is excluded. Hear the word slaughter in parenthesis there. Um, God is slaughtered out of the picture and ends up with something that becomes um, profoundly problematic. The, the word he uses in Roman numeral two at the top of page 12, a serious lapse into skepticism. I just noted to the side in on my copy here that um, Paul Metzger in his book, More Than Things, opens saying the, the modern world has lost 
faith, hope, and love and replace them with cynicism, narcissism, and pessimism. And I think those are apt ways of saying in a world that lapses into this skepticism about God and takes over with an anthropocentric center, that that is part of what humanity is left with, is the cynicism, narcissism, and pessimism, and that that's going to be an implicit kind of conversation through the rest of the concerns that Torrance has in this book, that I think that uh, Paul has done some good work in really laying it out, and the, the loss of ethics in that the, the subtitle of that, A Personalistic Ethics for a Theological Culture and More Than Things. So the thingness of what happens when you lose God, that's the concern for Torrance as he pits these early um, anthropocentric philosophers and scientists over against what in point H is James Clerk Maxwell whose mind was deeply rooted in God, point H there. So he's going to go on and talk about just the whole nature of Maxwell and his restorative work in field thinking. Point J, Einstein then comes in to bring Maxwell's work into field theory. And for Torrance, this is a beginning of, of resurrection, of the restoration of what science might do, that there's something that is appropriately... Um, model there in the ordering of our thoughts that's grounded in something that has mystery and in point eight a distinct movement toward the unitary thinking of general relativity so once again holding it all together a proper science who co-inheres with a proper theology in the unity of all things the continuous indivisible field in which field and matter were separated interpenetrating realities and his rejection of action at a distance, which injected time into the material substance of the field. That's referring to Maxwell's development of the continuous indivisible field. So the nature of Maxwell and um, Einstein, they become the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, and they, they run over the end zone in the last moment for Torrance and give us the piece that we need to put together in a team um, work to give us something that Torrance can build on, but he's going to then move to the ultimate one and point R, Michael Polanyi, for whom belief belief is an engagement with the nature of reality in such a way that, again, the blessing of the flow of reality to the receptive thinking of the human, we are informed by reality and we believe in an increasingly engaging way, indwelling is Polanyi's term there, so that we are encountering and able to deal with the nature of reality and all of reality in a way where the personal factor is not lost. In fact, for Polanyi, we are persons in all of our knowing, personal knowledge, his Gifford lectures. The nature of science is persons who engage the personal world, and we aren't playing this, um, don't look at that little man behind the curtain down there kind of, Thing, which for Torrance, that's kind of what's happened is that science has become at the control and not dealing with the nature of reality. So for Polanyi, this nature of a prior intuitive contact with reality, which um, Esther Meek has written one of her books, Contact with Reality, building on Polanyi's kind of framing here that all of science, as well as Torrance's sense of theological science, is engaging with all of reality. And one must engage it instinctively, intuitively in a way to be taught. And so kata fusen is that reality is the teacher, and we are those who listen and are continually gaining insight into what's going on. But it's a continuously learning kind of positioning that we have. In point I, um, at the top of 15 there, Polanyi's stress on the priority and controlling role of, of basic belief relates to his conception of the tacit coefficient in scientific theology, without which it has no bearing upon reality. So this, again, is another. It's Science has been slaughtered in the narrow sense of the word that we use, slaughtering. In its attempt to gain something, it lost touch with reality. It lost touch with contact of what reality itself is and became 
involved in selecting. I mean, this is one of Polanyi's critique. Scientists can select the thing they want to study and turn a blind eye to everything else. Right, they only know a very narrow part of the field, and therefore they've lost the context, even context even for science, not to mention the loss of God. And so Polanyi's final statement in his book Personal Knowledge is that having gone through with communities who engage all of reality is, and this, as I understand it, is the place of the Christian as it stands before God in worship. Worship then becomes this act of the science of knowing God coming to be taught by the one who we come to. So that's even Polanyi's pointing towards um, the point that is here. So in point two, if all knowledge could be reduced to explicit formal relations, impersonal logical operations would take over completely and knowledge would be mechanized, which I wrote there, dead on arrival. Right, you've just killed all of our knowledge. It's been mechanized generalized, disconnected from reality, science becomes dead on arrival and can't give life to what it is that we need life to be given to. So he goes on with Polanyi for a while, but we're going to turn over to page 16. In concluding the discussion on the priority of belief, two comments may be offered. In the first place, the orientation that has been taking place in the foundations of scientific knowledge traced back to Clerk Maxwell through Einstein and Polanyi demands that we must recognize belief or intuitive apprehension once more as the source of knowledge from which our acts of discovery take their rise. And this, again, is the blessing of we have to reopen the flow of understanding from God to ourself to be taught by reality. For it is in belief that we are in direct contact with reality through belief that our minds remain open to the invisible realm of intelligibility independent of ourselves. and. So again, this is the whole sense of the reopening of the flow between God and ourselves, that science has the capacity in being open to all of reality, might hear and not get sidetracked and divided. In the second place, the transition that has been taking place away from abstract, formalistic, and impersonal modes of thought to one in which the personal coefficient of knowledge is restored. So the person who knows and is part of the knowing process, i.e. personal knowledge, and not only do we know as persons, but it's the opening up to knowing God as person that God's revelation becomes significant as God wants to be known. Now we have a proper science and theology, both open in our receptive place, but also in God's self-giving place to open the flow of knowledge of God's self in the process, particularly in the person of Christ. Page 16, the bottom there, this is Dwayne's section. The theology of light. The light has come. So, again, in the course of the work of Einstein and Maxwell, he's going to say new things open it up. Point B, nothing has occupied a more significant place in these developments than the deepening conception of light. So, it's evident, he says, the switch from the mechanistic to a relational interpretation of nature. One could think of light in a sense as just mechanistic. You know, it just starts at point A and it goes to point B. And is it a wave? Is it a particle? You know, we could just reduce it kind of to mechanical um, type things. But again, there's something broader that Torrance wants to get here. The, um, the end of point C there is physics has brought us to the conception of the universe as a universe of light. So once again, we're moving into a holistic way of thinking that isn't just seeing the particularity of a particle or a wave, but that somehow there's something about light that fills and, and sustains and in a, sense, in a sense is consistent with the whole nature of the universe. And the universe unfolds its rational harmony and beauty because of light. And in point E, nevertheless, it reveals itself to be constituted and flooded by light which in spite of its vast difference is surely a created reflection of the uncreated and unlimited light, which God himself is. So he's making a correlation here. And you have to say, well, which is first? Well, the uncreated light is first. God is the uncreated light. He creates a world where the nature of light fulfills the function of God. And again, to use the word blessing, to open up and for the flow of God's good purposes and creating and sustaining the world and humans within it. 
and all that science would study. It functions as the God is the ground and grammar and sustainer and organizer of divine and contingent order. All of that would fall within what is implied within what light opens up for us as a picture, created light, creating created light and all that, that comes through it. Point G, uncreated light constitutes the ultimate ground of its intelligibility and as such establishes it and gives it is true value apart from such a basis in uncreated light. All our experience and knowledge of things in the universe would finally be meaningless, which is the, that's the, the critique of when you remove God, ultimately everything becomes meaningless and purposeless. Um, for they would be devoid of any ultimate standards of truth, goodness, or beauty. So the nature of light as God's created way of being is going to be something that sustains the very nature of the universe as we experience it. He then takes on these points, which point one is the constancy of light. He builds his whole understanding of the faithfulness of light, reflecting the faithfulness of God. And science at some level needs to be faithful to all that and to not break everything apart, um, which he Science at some level breaks things apart and doesn't maintain them together. And so it loses the faithfulness of the universe as it's sustained and the, the God who is the ground and source of all that is absolute and chooses its point of reference, the human point of reference. The scientist takes on an authority that rightly belongs to God. And so the scientist becomes Lord over instead of servant of created order. And point two the constancy of light also points to the invisibility of light and that light is invisible. You can't see light, but you can see because of light. C.S. Lewis's famous statement is, I don't merely believe in the sun because I can see it, but rather that by it, I can see everything else. I think that is an, an echo in a sense of what it is that Torrance is pointing out here as well, that you can't see light. His metaphor is of, we we think we can see light, but the nature of, you know, trying to see light, you may see dust flying in the light. It makes visible things, but it's not light itself that you are seeing. In his comment on the top of, top of page 19, he's going to talk about Augustine in the West and John Philoponos in the East, as, as Duane was pointing out. Again, Augustine worked with a basic... Um, what was his philo philosophical? It was, I didn't write it down. He Plutonic. was influenced by Plato, Neoplatonic. So if you work with a Platonic thing, then you tend to, to make ideas and the breaking apart of things. Again, the concerns of the psychological analogies of the human and in the nature of the universe, the nature of light, he has these three distinctions, a threefold distinction between uh, the physical light of nature, the intelligible light of the mind, and then the uncreated intelligible light of God. So the dividing process there for Augustine, though he was a theologian, has an unintended consequence, as Duane points out, that ends up with another another act of science slaughter, at least, and potentially threaten God slaughter, because now you're breaking up the very nature of God. So John Philoponos is the one who Torrance is going to bring in who talks about the contingent nature of the universe with its unitary rational order um, and discarding the epistemological dualisms of the Neoplatonists, i.e. St. Augustine and the Aristotelians alike. Through commitment to Christian belief in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, he rejected any cosmological dichotomy between heaven and earth, including light. Right? So... Light is the invisibility of God and light that hold together all things. Dwayne, I see that hand. Yeah, I, I just want to read something because 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 like I've got to represent Carrie McGruder here with contingency and John McKenna with contingency. That yes. that point is is the most important thing for us to understand. Everything is free to po for to the possible. I, mm. I just want to read something on page eighty six here. Uh, strange and astonishing as we may find it. God makes all things operate together for good, regardless of the divergencies of human reactions to his saving love. 
because his grace is so sovereignly free and unlimited in its possibilities that his interaction with humanity, God provides the invariant but dynamically objective ground for the fulfillment of his eternal purpose in creation. Hmm. You know, hmm. I don't know how you can say it any better than that. Yeah. Well, he has he has many very quotable things in here, but the nature of contingency, as Carrie often will either bring up with other sciences, is one of the great contributions of theological thinking to understanding the work of science. So your point is well taken, and, and thank you for bringing that, that to us. Brighton has said, I wonder what TF would make of moves to delve into the nature of dark matter. And I'm, I'm just wondering about Karl Barth's sense of um, das Nikta, the the nothingness as you know it's this you can't describe it because it's not just not light it's it's something beyond that so that's a it's a very interesting question i have no idea what he would have thought there but it, it's a good question and if somebody and if finds I the may, answer i mean go if ahead. i may jungle has taken that thought a bit further when he talks about the crucifixion gives nothingness its true topos mm. now the word topos is place but it's not yep. because it it's nothingness but it's given its due reference so that the undertow of the nothing is now in fact disposed of accommodated denied in its consequences and i think jung is onto something about yeah. the significance of the disarming of the principalities and powers through the cross. I mean, it's very heady stuff. And uh, even when you talk about it, I'm not quite sure what the heck I've said. <laughs> be be because it really is. It's terribly heady stuff. I mean, you know, the topos. Yeah. Das Nichtia is given its due topos through the crucifixion. Yeah. I mean, Hank... Hang on to that one for a while, Ken, and see what that does to your glossary. <laughs> it is finished. How do they say it in Australia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telestai. Telestai. The 10 most famous letters in the whole of the New Testament. It has achieved its goal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I'll be curious. Uh, dark matter, for me, illustrates uh, how... Theologians and physicists can be should be commenting and talking to each other. Oh, another thing, this is a, probably one of my pet peeves: the word chaos. Uh, the yes. word chaos is wide all over the the uh, the culture. It's in headlines. It, it's being used. The chaos in Washington. The chaos over there. The chaos upstairs. Uh, chaos, 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 chaos. That's not what the Greeks meant by chaos, and it's certainly not. Uh, the tohu and bohu of 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 the Hebrew Bible, uh, which is no order at all. When they when we use chaos to mean a lot of disorder, like I just dropped the silverware drawer and now it's chaos on my on my kitchen floor. Uh, that's not the meaning of the word. Uh, yeah. And now, just so I want to probe dark matter. Say what is dark, and what is matter? What are we talking about here? I've yeah. never had a chance to pursue that. I expect there's probably a 30-year-old book that will explain it wonderfully to me, uh, and especially having just read the, the Theology of Light and Word and Number, I, I feel better equipped to go and, and look at that. But uh, I expect it's not what most of us think of when we think dark matter. But yeah. it's just, mm, matter Good. we can't well, I think that's the point, Ken. We're not sure what we're examining with the notions of dark matter. Right. I, I, I really think we are on boundary situations here, which Torrance talks about a lot, doesn't he? Here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in terms of stratification of knowledge. Yeah. The That'll boundaries be between things, and and I mean, heck, we need perhaps a really extraordinary paradigm shift, if I can use that language again. Uh, I think we will be exposed to something here. The, That's my suspicion. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the new the new telescope that's been sent out way yeah, yeah. deep into space yeah. is sending back pictures 
every day that I see yep. in the paper. My news feed says, oh, we, we're going to have to lay aside this entire scientific theory. We're going to have to yeah. stop talking this way. We're going to have to start talking that. And, and this stuff is coming in daily. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, we won't yep. have Tom to guide us, but there's a plenty of smart people out there. And the, yeah. the, the, the physicists are going to need some help getting over the hump because they may be working with old paradigms, old language that is yeah. no longer uh, true. It no longer accurately reflects the wider truth of the universe that is being revealed to us. Uh, and occasionally you think, oh, maybe I should worship. Don't worship the telescope, worship the God, but the, the God who makes it all. It, it's reviving. And, Go ahead, Brian. And, and can I give a plug for the Netflix documentary on that web telescope's construction and ah. everything else. It's it's only an hour long. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a it's a terribly profoundly educating and worshipful experience to follow that documentary. So it was when Tom talks about humanity as the priest of creation. It's uh, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful it's point beautiful. to that. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. beautiful. Thank yeah. you, Ken. Yeah, yeah. Good. So just pressing on a little bit here in on page 20, 20 years, no, no, no apologies necessary. Um, point A, through the establishment of a reciprocity between God and man in which the uncreated light of God adapts itself to the lowly understanding of our finite minds. And at the same time, through the creative touches, touch elevates to them to commune with God in such a way that they may have access to him beyond their cre creaturely capacity. So, to say light is the scientific ability of God to make himself known in the person of Jesus. It is the opening up of the blessing, the flow, the reconciliation of persons um, beyond the slaughter of humans of God, which we could say the cross is the slaughter of God and the resurrection is, it is the restoration of the blessing of God through the person of Jesus Christ brought to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the nature of light is, in a sense, the metaphor of God in scientific self-giving to be known so that there can be this restorative kind of process. When he moves on over in page 21 to point three, his third feature is the inaudibility in of light. He says, with our, our created light, it doesn't talk. But the nature of the light that comes in the person of Jesus is we have audible talk. And so, again, the show I've been watching is called Silent Witness. This is the point where Torrance says, guess what? We don't have a silent witness. We have a living witness, the one who was dead. He helps us to do the forensic piece. He helps us to see beyond and to see the nature of the act of God, the death of God, but the resurrection of God. And so the nature of an appropriate science is that it allows both uncreated light and created light to speak and if you only look at created light and miss the uncreated light, you're just not dealing with all of reality. And in fact, the one who created it, your silencing of that one or thinking that God is silent is merely your deafness to which the gospels basically speak. The deaf and the no one is so blind as he who will not see or deaf as one who will not hear. So he goes on on page 22 to his fourth and final point, and that is word and number. So again, he wants to say there is reality and we as human beings, we need to talk about it. Um, in, the sh in the episode I was watching last night in, in uh, the fourth season, there's a theater that burns and there are 16 people who have died in there. One of them, nobody, nobody knows anything about them and they can't tell. And I haven't seen the second half of it, but it, it's becoming obvious that this is somebody who everyone thought was dead and he's been living for some time. And the person who went to prison because he was dead, they want to stay in prison. Even if he didn't actually kill this person who may have been alive, but showed up in this theater. And so the nature of reality and the nature of the loss of contact with reality, and then what it looks like to say we, we may start by numbering this person as simply body number 10 of 16, but the nature of good theology and the nature of good science is that we learn to understand the dynamic, the personal nature of God, human persons, 
And Adam told was told to name the animals. There is something about a naming that is a relational way of being that is part of the whole of what science appropriately does. And so number and word are associating ways that we identify, not leaving an impersonal determinate in an inanimate world, but a world which is created, which has meaning, which has purpose. And we, so we find language, we can measure and name and explain those things, allowing the interpretive part that we play as a kata fusen, engagement with the, all that is there. And so in point six at the bottom of 22, there, Roman numeral six, in all this process, word and number, number and word, necessarily interact with one another. Number cannot come to expression, nor can it be consistently and meaningfully handled apart from the interpretive and controlling function of word, which word there, again, ultimately is going to be the person of Jesus. But if, if mathematicians and physicists detach number from word and interpretation, it's an act of science slaughter, right? They're not allowing the interpretive dimension to be there. And so they have done a work with unintended consequences of not being able to see. An ad in a local hospital said, we don't, we don't just do health care, we do person care. What are they saying? We don't just see you as a body that we can weigh and measure and all that. We see you as persons. We'll treat you as a person, not merely as a body. And I think they're seeing some of the point that Torrance is making in this section. We need the numbers. We need to know weight and does they have a pulse? And, you know, how, what are the numbers on um, cholesterol and those things? You know, what are the possible things that have gone wrong? We need the numbers, but for the purpose of the interpretive work of what it is that's going on. So at the top of page 23, it is the aim of theological science to inquire into the ways and works of God as they were made known through his divine revelation to mankind and through them to all to worship and know God in his utter distinctness from all that was made without. So one is restoring it all without, this is the God's letter, projecting into our knowledge of him creaturely images and representations of any kind. So that is the act of, in my narrow sense of the word, God slaughter here. We end up killing God by filling in with all of our idols and misconceptions about God that do not get to God at all. In point Roman numeral X, about halfway down the page, the main interest of the theologian in accordance with the personal and intangible nature of his subject matter falls upon word or logos, for through his inquiries, he seeks to understand an objective rationality which may be expressed appropriately in and through language. So, we need language to understand God, the word made flesh. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is a livingness to the light of the word, and that word does come and interpret, explain. No one is seeing God at any time, but the only one who is in the heart of the Father, he has come to exegete him to us, John 1, 18. The nature of the voice who comes to reveal the heart of the Father. All of this is this work of the words that enable us to transcend the limitation and to engage the whole of reality of the God who is actually there. And point 12 at the bottom, it follows from the common concern of natural science and theological science with objective rationality and reality that they are also concerned to recognize that truth is not invented, but discovered. And so here again, Greek and Roman concepts of truth tend to be separated away from the nature of reality. They're granted human authority, but here the nature of reality itself is the authority over itself. And we are discoverers who come to know that which that can be known. And on the next page, 24.14, we may characterize the distinction between discovery and revelation. What is it we're looking at? the basic difference between the nature of objects and the nature of um, theological inquiry. So one is discovery, that's us discovering, and the other is revelation, that's God giving God's self to be known. So points 15 and 16, in natural science, authentic learning is an act of sheer discovery. Point 16, theological science, authentic learning is also an act of sheer discovery. 
we are not concerned with projecting into God, but with learning something about God, which is radically new to us. So again, there is a sense of distinction because of the nature of what is studied, and yet in both cases it is a, a allowing that which we are studying to be discovered insofar as it wants to be known or as God gives God's self to be known. The top of page 25, he goes to Wittgenstein. Um, the point that he's making there is there is a necessary relation between word and things. If a, if a word has any meaning, it's because it connects to a thing. And this is the question of you know analytic philosophy and theology today. To what degree is the analysis separated from the nature of that which is being analyzed or reading into it? That's my concern with that. There's another quote, not here, by Wittgenstein. A picture held us captive. And what is he saying there? That we get these pictures, which is at least as big as a culture, and it holds us captive and we can't see outside of it. So his idea that the, the mind is in the world and the world is seen through the lens of our culture and this limits us and that we can no longer see God. Our culture holds us captive. The form of truth telling that they hold has become something void of God and therefore it ends up to be God slaughtering. Our cultures become absent of God because we have removed God or killed God out of it. So the nature of what is being opened up here by Wittgenstein is just an understanding of the nature of the tragedy when we separate theory and practice, when we separate thinking, philosophical thinking from the nature of engaging the world. And that for the purpose of what Torrance is wanting to do is that we need a deeper thinking that our picture is opened up. He uses images of pictures like puzzles that are put together and how easy it is when you, it's difficult on one side, but the other side, there's just the picture of a person. If you put the person together, it's all easy. And then you turn it over and all of the other pieces fall into place. That's one of the metaphors of what it is that's going on there. So we need something deeper than mere theory which the word theory, again, is connected to the theater, to see something from a distance. So in this whole, uh, this whole series that Torrance is doing, our theories need to take us in contact with reality and not to stand back and watch. And that's why it looks like the mutual modification of theology and science and the work of Einstein's engaging the dynamics of reality are going to be so important for the work of the co-relationship between theology and science. I'm jumping over to page 27 here, the equilibrium in the framework of knowledge. Again, in the second point here then is the persistent dilemma on the horns of which our dualistically based European culture has been impaled again and again. Now I take his word impaled there. It's kind of like what I'm using the word slaughter. It, impaled feels fairly, fairly painful and all that, but it, there's something tragically lost and maybe killed, particularly since Sir Isaac Newton produced his immensely powerful and successful system of the world, natural science of the humanities. And so there, there was something where humanity took on something that left God out and has dealt with the consequences of that, whether it was intended or not, as Ken has pointed out, is a whole other thing. Newton was a good guy, Galileo, good guys. But, and again, even those people who've pushed back on Colin Gunton for being too hard on Augustine, I think that Gunton has a right inclination and that maybe Augustine didn't say everything, but the way that Augustine's been read has led into much of the problems that Gunton points out. And so there are broader contexts for doing the work there as well. On page 28, then, he goes on to talk about, on page 28 and 29 of my handout, the problems of election and predestination. What is the problem here? You break out God who is encompassing of all humanity, who elects for all humanity, versus people who want to break it apart. Nope, there are some who are in and some are out, and we need to divide all these things up, see the world being broken apart. You know, there's, there is the slaughter of salvation. You know, we've lost God and God's saving work. We've lost the confidence to of God's faithfulness to be the one who is our savior and not that we are either in the inner out book, um, whatever's there. And with the Christianity without incarnation, here we're concerned with way of thinking 
which is the very reverse of the biblical understanding of election as the incarnational advent of God himself among men. So again, the idea is that if Jesus isn't really God, if there isn't really an incarnation, then you've slaughtered God. We no longer have access to God. We've either got just, just a human or God's gone off on a long vacation. But the impact, maybe unintended for the culture, is that you no longer have a, a true theological science and you no longer have science. So the whole next page on page 30, I just have slaughter, slaughter, slaughter all along the way. Um, the, the ways of man's own self-understanding, the nature of science, the way it breaks things apart. Point C, the determinist view of dualism. Point D, the determinant framework. Everything's predetermined. Also an impersonal, non-dynamic view. All of these things are just Torrance ways that we've broken, divided, and slaughtered our concepts of God, hence slaughtered our um, our science and theology. At the top of page 31, um, classical Christian doctrines like incarnation and atonement appear to be unwarranted, this worldly objectifications, which are mythological, mythologically projected onto God. So those are two classical things that Torrance is going to see as ways that science has slaughtered God in my limited use of the word slaughter. I keep footnoting there for Ken's purposes. Um, so the nature, even in, in point E, clearly a theology thrown up with such an indeterminate frame of reference in which word relationality is cut off from the control by number reality, which I just see the word cut off there as curse. You know, once you start breaking apart word and number, which he's doing in here, you lose touch with reality, you lose touch with God, your numbers take over and measure things, but it has no meaning or purpose. And science has become void of, of meaning. So in his point F, we end up with a form of mythological thinking, um, only inconceivable in terms of man's own prior self-understanding. So God gets taken out. Point G, the naturalistic and secularistic development emptying the world of meaning, another act of science slaughter, I think. We've lost the ability to find meaningful science, I would say there. So Maxwell and, and Einstein have been restorers. They've been part of the resurrection of the possibility of science and theology. Um, and in point H, there is this, um, there is a parallel to mythical thinking that's still widespread in contemporary culture, which we must note. This has to do with our now familiar search for one's proper image or identity, which results from a schizoid malaise of modern life. And I hear that just as the self-slaughter of modern life. Namely, the detachment of image from reality in the roots of the human person and behind the detachment of the human person from an objective ground in the creative word and rationality of God. So humanity has slaughtered its own image of who we are as persons what it means to function as persons because we've lost the God who created us. And the end is that you end up point H, a schizoid malaise of this kind can affect a whole culture. And so here, you know, the title of the book, Christian Theology and Scientific Culture, it's a culture that ends up with a schizoid malaise, which I wrote a culture of fear, of narcissism, of confusion. And I have books that are named these things, culture of fear, culture of narcissism, so that's what you get when you don't um, take seriously what this book is attempting to bring to the fore, that what you lose isn't just old thoughts about a God far away. It is the very integrity of culture to be something that is meaningful, purposeful, hopeful for humanity to be all that humanity might be. And the last point at the bottom of page 32, there is a spiritual authenticity to natural science which Christians must not ignore, for it is grounded in the authenticity, the genuine depth and integrity of the creation as it came from God. And so to say, all of it is blessed, science and theology, and so far as it allows God to be the one who has connected all things and the flow of his life is the life-giving hope that we hope for. And that is the call of the church. That is the call of science. That is the call of all persons to live in the light of that. So there you go in one sitting, a fairly intense book. Don't need the book, have the outline. <laughs>
The book has much more than what I gave you. That was a. Uh, I know, you, I know. Yeah. You know, you need your book. It is. Uh, I read uh, it a month it, ago, and uh, going over it again this morning, I realized how much I missed yeah. the first time. I have to read it again. And I think every book you read of Torrance's gives you lenses to see the other ones. And I, I think that the nature of this book is it just it's a book that allows you to see and hear things in the other books. But have other lenses, and you each one of them um, allows for insight. Um, and hopefully, my use of the word God slaughter, manslaughter, science slaughter, all that has given you some sense that Torrance has, I think, of the seriousness of the problem that's there. And as Dwayne says, it's unintended, got it. Um, but nevertheless, the impact is there. And so his ultimate vision as a theologian really is to be a doctor of the church. And so this series that he edited and gathered together, I think has that therapeutic healing dimension to it that he really wants to be there. But we've got to diagnose what went wrong before we can then just see the answer, right? Um. Any last comments? Heavy words so lightly thrown, says Dwayne. Yeah. No, I think I think I think the reality is this is the whole point of God's uh, saving work. It's the 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 world models and reflects the confusion in the church. The world cannot be blamed for its confusion if the church is authentic. It can be blamed, but if it's inauthentic, it it can't be blamed. And and that's sort of the same thing with Israel. It's analogous. Because Israel failed in their priesthood role to be the light to the nation, say, oh, what wise laws does your God have? And what an amazing, you know, economy you have and where there's people so happy and your children are flourishing, you know, and that everyone wants to follow your example. Like, we're, and so are our, our, the chaos in our culture and the fragmentation, you know, j just the fact, that, you know, Tom's uh, con condemnation about the lack of unity. It's not, yep. it's the lack it of is. unity in the body of Christ where we all have yep. our own denominations right. and we split up ourselves and fragment ourselves. And we think we're authorized in having uh, beliefs that aren't the truth, yep. that our own perversion, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's the lack, the lack of the love of the truth, you know, in, in, cause, it, cause it's both love and truth that yep. God has given us access to interpret things. And because there's, there's a lack of both of those things, grace isn't, you know, affecting us in the way the fruit kind of the fruit that it should yeah yeah absolutely so i think this is a very prophetic book for exactly the reasons that you're saying it speaks to the issues of our time this isn't just to the issues of torrance's time or the 1980s when he wrote this in 1981 is when it was published um it speaks to our times and that is part of the the brilliance of torrance's work it has an enduring validity to it and it just calls us to ask the questions again and again how do we see that, Dwayne, as you've just said, in our own time? And that it's just so obvious. Where, where, does the word, uh, where does the word collapse? Like, I, I, I actually, I honestly think, I know Tom's, uh, uh, his, his vision, like he talks, there's no need for doom and gloom and stuff like that in his apocalypse now where he writes about that because we've already won. But the fact that we're the generation upon whom these things are coming upon us and it yeah. looks like collapse yeah. is imminent. Well, there yeah, will be things that collapse, and those are things that don't really serve humanity well, and they ultimately self-collapse because they just fra fragment into their own death. Right. So I think I think that all those things that are merely human agenda set up have a destructive expiration date on them, and they will expire. But the word of God, I mean, you too song October, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but you go on and on and on. So I think that that is the truth behind this book that Torrance holds fast to, and that all of these kingdoms and forms of science, they will they will fall, and yet we are holding to the one who is is greater and in fact made and sustains all these things. So very good. Well, next, let's see, what do we have next week? We have something exciting. I have to remember what it is. Oh, uh, next week, next week we have Jason Radcliffe is going to introduce us to the introduction, which is 35 pages long, 
of T.F. Torrance's doctorate, the Doctrine of Grace and the Epistolic Fathers. So um, he is he is a you know a great scholar of the interaction of T.F. Torrance and the early church fathers, apostolic fathers being a subset of that. So he's going to get us get us going in that. And um, he's already sent me his handout. How how amazing is that? We haven't even finished this session. He's already sent me his handout. So I will post that hmm. very quickly. Um, and I will at least post this the introduction for people to be able to read because it does introductions like this lay a foundation for the whole book. Do all of you have the book or do any of you not have it? I have it. Yeah, okay. So anyway, I will post both his handout as well as, as the introduction that he'll be discussing. And then we'll be off on a, a journey in, in that text. And that'll take us through September in that book in our primary texts. What we did today is not part of my primary text series. This is part of the series that Torrance edited, which he contributed one of them. So we'll do that once a month, too, for the next five months. But we'll do um, <laughs> the, these months, eight months on the doctorate. And then we'll begin into theological science. And that will, I think, probably go over 19 sessions because um, even even the short sections are are pretty long, and the long ones go up to 30 pages. So I want to take time to really go through theological science with care. And um, people are excited about presenting in that as well as reading through it. It is a monumental piece in the uh, in the Torrance collection of books. So good. Well, thank you all for being here today. <laughs> Uh, if if you, you would, I need uh, 30 or 40 days notice in order to block out time. Uh, so if you could, uh, if, when you know you're going to, your yeah, date is set and something to go, can you put that on the, uh, uh, as quick as possible on the, on the web page, uh, the web page, the it's Facebook page, so, so yeah. I can, uh, so I can. So I will. I, can I will send you what you out. need today for your session. The other thing is the TF Torrance Fellowship has a page that has everything listed and videos of the past since 2020. So everything of the past is listed. Everything that's coming mm -hmm. um, is up there. And I will be switching your name, Ken, for the week that you'll be doing. Okay. And so. Um, so that Jerome can take that spot. So everything that I have, whenever I get somebody. I put it up there so that the future, as far as I know it, is listed there. Well, and even the when we don't yeah. have all of the theological science ones listed, I'll still put up what will be covered on those sessions. As I get people to take those sessions, I'll put up their names Actually, as well. Marty, what are you going to Italy and, and is Italy and Greece you're going to here? I, yes, I, I looked at the calendar the other day. What are you going there for? That is called a cruise. And it begins oh, in Rome, going there to do some study. four days extra in Rome and five days extra in Athens. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So, so, and then we'll be going Venice and up around um, the Mediterranean there, ending ending in Athens and doing two two days on a Greek island. So that's... Um, is that's is, is, is that just a, a, a secular cruise or is that a, some kind of religious I will or be theological cruise? with God the whole way. It oh, okay. Spiritual and every way that I can make that possible. Yeah, because that's because that's region's been going that way to have different professors lead cruises, you know. They and, asked and, me yet. If they had asked me, <laughs> I would do it. Yeah, I need to get well, that's more the education. Because because it, it, I can't it's it's uh, Paul Spielsbury's wife. Um, I can't think of her name offhand, but she's the one who maintains that. You never know. You know right. Uh, well, if you talk to her and say, "Hey, I know somebody who you should have." To yeah, I'll, do. I'll, I'll let her. I'll let her know. I'll let her know because because uh, yeah. the way things would, are going in the like Middle East and doing, stuff like that. I would like to be doing that kind of, you know, engaging people in conversation on boats hmm. and and going to uh, seminaries and bringing theology to where people live. I don't get many invitations, and it takes people just like you who have that vision and say, you know, you should consider this person for that to happen. So, yeah. So anyway. All right. Oh, thanks, Marty. It's great, okay, great time. Good to see you all. Friends. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, brothers. Good to see you. Thank you.